talk about risk in software. This is a night landing of a 737, current production aircraft. The green instrumentation that you Approach see is actually runway inside. Up on a head-up display. Uh, designed and produced by our company. So there's the runway. You see the uh, little two dots here that converge. That's a good thing when they're when they're converging because you're going to you're going to put it where it should be. 100. 50. 40. 30. 20. 10. Spoilers deployed. And how important do you suppose it is that the software driving that functions correctly? You know, it, it, that's kind of a little bit of context for what we'll talk about and how we think about lean at our company. And, and for context, I'll give a little bit of background on the company for the purposes of orientation. It'll, I apologize if it looks like a marketing piece. It is a little bit drawn from that, but I want to repurpose it for the discussion at hand, which is really about how to win new business and make money. It's easy to do the first one, win, but to do both is quite a challenge. And for a lot of businesses, it's really difficult to know if you're going to make money at the time you're actually pursuing a new opportunity. So over the years at our company, what we've done is, is try to take a lean approach to the idea of business development. And among other things, there's a kind of a mantra that we incorporate from a lean principle perspective into the way we approach new business. And it boils down to three questions that we keep asking at various levels. Is this opportunity real? Can we win if we compete? And if we compete and win, is it worth it? Strategically, uh, in terms of the business plan, and, of course, with, with, a, with a commercial business as we are, uh, that's a, that's a show-me uh, mandate. And, and so we've got the usual sorts of processes built around that in order to proceed. Um, let, let me ask folks in this room, have any of you ever been leading or a member in a new business pursuit? Anybody in here? Okay, hello, Israel. Anybody else? So... You as well, a little bit. Okay. What was your role in, in the in the new business pursuit you were involved in? Um, you were trying to get new type of licensing for your images, and you did what in that in that endeavor? Okay. Okay. So, so you scope the the what what the cost would be to implement if you won. Okay. Thank you. Hello. What was your role? Or and maybe it's more than one. Just pick one. Okay. Okay. Sure. So under an assumption that you won the business, the X was on your forehead to make sure you could execute. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Got it. We, we won't be able to deliver if we do. We're not, we don't have the capacity or capability to, or to do it. Or whatever it is. Yeah. Like if, if this were to work, we, you know, it would be the worst thing is if it were to work. Because, you know, really important. We'll come back to that. <laughs> it, Israel, uh, what was your role in, in such an endeavor? General manager uh, managing the P&S. Okay. So you want to make sure the team pursuing the business does both things. Wins and makes money. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and, and we've all got those. And so it's, it's really a, a, a critical struggle and, and a question around, you know, what is it to be good at this? And, and what does that mean for all of us, whatever role we may have in the organization? So uh, a, a crude attempt at a, at a definition of lean business development is, you know, how, and it's, it's the same question any enterprise. You've got a scarcity of resources. You've got to make choices for allocation. In this case, the context is about how you do that efficiently in order to win new business. And uh, what you want to do is, there we go, is apply scarce resources of people, investment capital, and the accumulated domain knowledge and assets of your organization, unless you're brand new, you try and leverage what you've got and, and in some kind of a creative way build up to the next thing that, uh, that builds your business further, expand into adjacent markets, uh, increase share in your own market, whatever it might be, uh, but make money doing it. Again, win profitable new business because, you know, as Hill L notes, uh, it's one thing to win new business. It's another thing to be able to execute it profitably. And there's some things that you just don't want to win. But if you do have to win in order to keep alive in aerospace and in, in the industry we're in, you've got you to have a capture rate, a success ratio of at least 20% of your attempts that you've selected to go after just to stay alive. In our industry, typically around 25% uh, success rate and upper range in the aggregate across all the different players in the organization around 40 percent. Uh, we far exceed that. Uh, what I'll tell you about in, the, in the, the next bit of time is a little bit of the how on that and want to engage you and encourage you actually to interrupt with questions too if, if you've got something that pops up there. But uh, what, what you really need to think about is how are you going to do that effectively and uh, I'll give you an example when you win, and it, it's perhaps a little bit of Hillel's uh, thing. W one, of the, one of the things I've done in a part of my career at my company is I've either led or been a team member in new business capture teams. Uh, I've personally led and acquired new business uh, totaling about $3.2 billion as measured by the value in the business plan of those wins at the time that we got authorization to offer them. High complexity systems, the kinds of things you saw in the little video there, uh, and uh, highly integrated with other systems, heavily regulated, uh, high, uh, high levels of integrity required. Uh, it's it's your, uh, your, the top row in your chart is real on, on your, prior, uh, your prior slide there, where the integrity levels are, are absolute because life is at risk. You know, it, it's got to work or everyone dies. Or if it's a war fighter, uh, you're putting your warfighters at peril. They can't execute their mission. Lots of other people could be in peril. You've got to be able to assure and execute correctly and do all that and make money. Uh, one, of the, one of the wins that I had was an entire avionics suite for a large commercial aircraft. I won't name it, but uh, uh, essentially after winning the business, they said, okay, you're it. Go execute, you know, which is which is really uh, where reality breaks in because it's one thing to be the capture guy, it's another to also own making it work after the fact, which is what Hillel was warning some of his colleagues about. And, and it's real important to get incentives aligned correctly across the organization so you're looking at those things and making sure you do that well. Uh, this, this particular one, it was a larger one, uh, I had a, a non-recurring engineering budget uh, for the program, which is a, uh, about a four-year program, $115 million, which meant that every day I was spending about a half million dollars in engineering labor. So every morning before lunch, quarter million dollars. And you get down to the hour, and you're very conscious about what it means to execute in a very lean manner. And all the things that we've talked about in the several days of this conference come to bear. Uh, our systems focus on, and these, these are not Google Glasses, by the way. We've been doing these things for, for a number of years on the military side. Uh, but those things, as they transition into commercial markets, are, are some of the things we've been doing for quite some time. Uh, the, uh, the avionics and systems on uh, this nice Falcon 900, uh, that very old MD-88 there, whatever it might be, uh, we, 
we count on making these things happen day in and day out as expected to support the business plans of our customers. And, and so basically what, what we focus on, this is the marketing part, I'll get through this fast, I'm not trying to sell the company here, just to give you context. Design, production and support of solutions for our customers, aerospace and defense. We're located in 27 countries. We do business in all countries where it is legal for the United States to conduct business because for one thing airlines operate just about everywhere and uh, we're on those aircraft uh, but it's not just on the commercial side on the, on the government side as well about 19,000 employees uh, split about half and half at any given time with sequestration we're drawing down and so that ratio will become a little bit even more balanced than before but it's a bit of a gyro in the business and there's there's technology uh, sharing and, and lots of goodness that comes from cyclical events that occur on either the commercial side or the military side and you can keep going because you're managing the risks at the portfolio level of a business adequately. Come back to this number here, 4.7 billion dollars in sales last year. This year if you look at our annual report when it comes out uh, and last year when you look at it, you'll see we spent a billion dollars in R&D. Okay, so a little bit more than 20% of all of our sales, we just turn around and invest again in the next thing. Uh, there are very few players in our industry. Uh, there's lots of barriers to entry that have to do with the integrity levels and the certification requirements and the nature of our customers that uh, make it uh, a very interesting place, like, like everybody's market is. There's always interesting aspects to it. Um, yeah. 4%. So we're 5x that plus. Okay, thanks Bob. So what, what we focus on, and these are not the only things that we do, uh, managing systems in an aircraft cabin, uh, comm, flight control. So uh, if you've got the software that defines the operation of a fly-by-wire aircraft, which will potentially more or less drop like a brick, unless it's constantly negotiating its path through space uh, with propulsion systems and, and guidance systems. Um, everything is at stake in that regard. You've got to make sure and pull it off well. Information management, integrated systems for mobile platforms, NAV, simulation, situational wireless, global service and support. Uh, we've got more geeks in the state of Iowa than anyone and, and probably in most of the contiguous states as well and, uh, and, and I mean that in a loving way these ladies and gentlemen are extremely good at what they do they're proud of it, they love it and uh, they spend a lot of money I'll go back to when I was program manager for that large program extremely expensive to sustain those kinds of activities so we, we've got to do them well a uh, little bit more on what we do here and essentially what we try and do is innovate in a smart way. Talked about some of those concepts already in terms of building upon what we've already done, sustaining, enlarging uh, our share in markets we're already in and, and going after new ones. Uh, and examples would be if we've got an in-flight entertainment system on an aircraft and we've also got the router that connects and routes information across the various aircraft systems and we've got a position on the flight deck, we could bring solutions to that aircraft manufacturer in terms of integration that could eliminate weight, eliminate wiring, and for every 180 pounds that uh, you get off the aircraft, you can either put another passenger paying revenue or increase the range of an ultra long range business jet uh, that translates into another aircraft sale and those things directly communicate to success for our customers those are the kinds of things we try and do and try and do them fast cost effectively and the focus really what we found is if you're not looking at what the customer needs your capture plan probably isn't going to work and you you're not going to prevail uh, we've had some success uh, with with the approach we've had innovation diversity because our ability to hire in the state of Iowa 
uh, and succeed in the long term means we've got to be very active in bringing in high quality talent from wherever we possibly can for these critical skill sets that are scarce, rare, and largely located on uh, large cities on the east or west coast of this country uh, or in other countries. And getting them to come to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. How many in, in this room, you can't answer, uh, know where Cedar Rapids, Iowa is? Okay, one, oh, quite a few of you do. All right, so that's more than I expected. Um, it's, uh, it's not an easy hire. It's not an easy recruit for, for people to, you want me to live where? You know, and, and to pull that off effectively. Uh, so, so pulling those things off well, we've had some success. So I'm kind of representing this, as Bob has said, as a company that has been at it for essentially about 20 years it being a lean approach systemically from portfolio management right down to the tactical action plan for some specific pursuit and how to go about that effectively. We could have been better than we are today and there's always reasons external to us over which we have no control and reasons that we had control over and we didn't realize it at the time. And we talked about this a little bit. Bob and I and, and uh, Art Gemmer uh, wrote a report a number of years ago uh, for Cutter in which we describe some of the aspects of organization redesign that the company went through after some drama. Uh, one of the points of drama which preceded this, the period we were talking about was an uh, infatuation of the principal founder of the company, Art Collins, who started the company in his garage in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, and uh, extremely successful, uh, lost a lot of money on a huge investment, economic downturn simultaneous with non-performance on the business plan had to sell the company. Rockwell International acquired it. Okay, so bad things happen even to good people. In the 80s, what we found was a wake-up call. We had traditionally been the go-to supplier for some of our large government contracts and systems. And we were declared technically uh, not viable for a couple of those. Never had it happened before. And we realized we were no longer going to be competitive in our market. We were still making plenty of money and, and doing very well, but the writing was on the wall. So we went through a fairly dramatic organization change, which led us to question and closely hew to a new line, which was to get lean around our major processes. And, and what it ended up being was a fairly profound set of changes <clears throat> at the enterprise level that nested shell fashion flowed down to the job profiles, the responsibility sets, and the actions that we take in, in going through there. And, and eventually, and this was quite recently, it was, it was last year, we retitled it as a new operating system. Um, those, who in here worked in, in corporate in the 90s? Anybody? Okay. So, so you may recall the transition from quality circles and Six Sigma and continuous process improvement uh, to the next phase, whatever it might be, but you had to have a vision and a mission. Do you remember that? And, and, and all the talks, well, yeah, we, we went through that too. And, and we have those, but we've augmented it. And we've, a we've added this thing called the operating system, which, which I thought metaphorically, as long as we're going with metaphors in Israel, was a great setup for that. Uh, we, we really focused from a lean perspective at the, at the enterprise level like most organizations in aerospace defense, we've got a phase gate process for evaluating new business and uh, going after it and then executing it. And, and so that's there. That's our core processes. So first is the ready step. We take a look at a five-year plan, a strategic and financial plan. We go after whatever we can in the way of very concrete opportunities. We pick them. We lay in assumptions around revenue for those lay in assumptions around investment requirements for those, scale them, do the trades, down select. So we know why we're going after what we're going after. And in that approach, we do evaluate to the extent that it's possible, calculate what we will get out of that in those trades and what does that mean for our long-term growth as well as our competitiveness and what might it mean for our competitors to win some of these things. And sometimes it's good to allow those competitors to win some of those things, which is one of the things Hillel was kind of warning about with, with some of his colleagues because there are some organizations and, and there are some customers 
that you're not correctly set up, you're not scaled, uh, you don't have the skill sets, or it's just plain low margin to go after it. You don't necessarily want them. Once you've got that list, we have a pursuit and order capture uh, phase, and that's where I live currently in our businesses, for all of the commercial businesses. So you saw that, uh, that split between uh, military and commercial. It was about half and half. So about two to two and a half billion dollars of pursuit and order capture. I'm responsible for that in our company. And I answer to our COO for all of the commercial businesses about, well, why aren't we better at this? What are you doing about that? Show me. And, and it's back to those same fundamental questions. And then I've got to interact with all of the capture teams to help them, make sure they've got what they need, break barriers for them, resource them, but also to monitor them for compliance to the requirements that we have as an organization for pursuit and order capture. Because it is a process, just like everything else. It can be rendered into that, and successfully so. Then you come into design and development, which is, which is where you were looking at what's it going to cost when we actually have to implement and uh, the actual build step and then service and support well beyond the uh, production life cycle of the system. Uh, perhaps in our case, it's normal uh, to have a, uh, a strategy session with our customers that could have a duration of five to ten years. Then there's a competition phase which could be anywhere from one to two years. It could be shorter string than that, but we usually know they're coming as part of our strategic and financial planning, and we accommodate that in our overall approach. And then we win. We work with the customer. It's probably a multi-year development activity. And uh, we go through the development phase with them. They finally enter into service, which is the build step here, and they probably field that system and sell it for anywhere from three to 15 years. And then usually there's an agreement that we will continue to support our systems until X number of platforms are, uh, as long as X number of platforms are still in service. And that might be like five. So the life cycle on our activities could have a duration of 30 years, 40 years. You talk about uh, technical debt, and software maintenance and the costs associated with that over that span of time. Got to be really lean around those things to pull those off effectively. Lifecycle value stream management and shared services, we're a matrix organization and we have a focus on a program structure is really the short story on that. Lean electronics, we'll talk about that now in the next little bit, and then quality and compliance. But I'll note here, lean sits in its own band in the operating system, distinct from quality, distinct from the traditional locations in lots of organizations. And uh, because it's focused at that highest level, we see it as key to our competitiveness and to delivering value, both to the customer and our shareholders. <clears throat> High level look at what, where we've been. Started with some basic lean tools and lots of activities. We weren't very effective and we weren't very efficient either. But by gosh, everybody was in some kind of lean activity and they were able to check it off in their activity for that year when they were reviewed. Any of you have to do that right now? Yeah, so there's people shaking their heads. It becomes more relevant and real in people's minds when you can see a connection between that activity that you're supposed to do and real results for the business. So over time, hopefully you've had that experience that we've had as well as, okay, yeah, I do see real value coming out of this. This is not just going through the motions and checking a box. And over time we got there in, in a variety of different ways I'm not going to go into any detail on this other than to suggest there's some pretty important things that you've got to go through in a certain firing order to prevail. Question, Israel. I, I would love to talk about the merging of Lean and Six Sigma, but I don't have a, an adequate detailed story for you. What I would say is what we've done is we've brought together specific kinds of tool sets methods and approaches like Six Sigma with our overall enterprise level approach. So it's, it's really at the highest level the answer is we made sure it was integrated rather than tactical or opportunistic. Okay, So we had to make sure there was a reason we were or were not employing 
Six Sigma methodology, and we knew why. So that's, that's kind of the short story. Did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Hillel, did you have a question? No. Okay. Thank you. So, again, we, we've got a, a pretty elaborate stairway to heaven here in, in terms of what we do uh, as we conduct lean at whatever level we might conduct it in the organization to help teams face the tough questions that I present to them ahead because the COO, the Hillels of the world, are, are, are going to ask them these things. And they better have an answer. And it better be fact-based. And if it's not, they're going to have a bad day. Uh, and they might not have a, a very good career either. We take it very seriously. We tie it to personal and career success. If you've led and successfully captured new business of significance, you are a high pot and you will do well in our organization. If you haven't had chance, that's understandable. There's other ways to succeed. But this is a way to really stand out. And it has real meaning for us in our careers. And having answers for these things, especially this one at the end, differentiation. If you don't have a differentiator between yourself and your competitors, what's your outcome going to be in terms of profit? Any, anybody? If you don't have a differentiator against other competitors, oh, you're, a you're a commodity. What's that mean for margin and profit? Well, margin, you'll be happy to get 6%. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be an undesirably low number, it, whatever it might, 6% or even less. It, it might be damn near zero, depending on. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so, absent a differentiator, you're really not in a good spot and, and you're not going to have a good day with the COO when you're reviewing what your total capture plan is. Because all he sees is he's not making as much money as he should. You're not coming through with what you need to do. So we strive to identify those and execute those. Typical situation, new business development. You put yourself in that, in that mode. You're trying to win and this is pretty universal. And, and this is where you're at at the beginning. You're not winning. Your price is too high because your costs are too high. You came in with a number that was far higher than I could stand in terms. Was it NRE you were looking at in your non-recurring engineering investment? Is that what you were looking at or was it standard cost or both? Cost of the product. The materials of it? The software. The software. To, to develop it? Okay, so we would call that non-recurring engineering cost. Yeah, so, so you're looking at that, and, and so you come in. Uh, I'm the capture team leader. I know that I do my market analysis, my competitiveness analysis. I know what my price to win is. I know what my expected margins are. I've got to do my work on my costs. And you come in with a number that's much higher than I can stand, and I'm not happy, and my COO is not happy. And, and that drives my price too high. And by the way, I'm struggling to find a way to differentiate. The customer remembers a couple of programs I had with them before where I didn't perform very well. Um, there may be some unacceptable elements of risk. And, and if there are, you really got to stop and say, shall we proceed? Or should we take a different strategy and either withdraw or be in there to create a bad day for our competitors? and spoil them, okay? There's some real important questions to ask along the way. Uh, you may not have your total uh, supply chain well established yet. You don't know enough about your competition, guaranteed, because ethically, you probably can't find out everything that you need to, and you have to be legal and ethical about that. And we're not distinctive. And, and so what you end up with is an attractive, multi-volume, four-color, highly complex, deliverable, in response to an RFP or an RFI, typical in, in our industry. And procurement looks at that, at the customer, <clears throat> and they've got two others that are just like it, just as attractive, just as complex, just as comprehensive. And they say, any of them will do. They rack and stack them and they put them on a matrix. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, who's got the lowest price? Bad day. So we're forcing them to do that unless we're very clever about how we go about it. <clears throat> so what we try and do is connect those dots as much as we can 
uh, from the operating system through Lean to very specific, and, and I, I, I actually substituted language, and this is an actual slide. We have a quarterly cadence with our COO for what it takes to win on very specific strategic pursuits. And we name key areas that we're going to go after, we identify targets for them, and we show high-level action plans, and we status those. Part of our, our bonus for the entire corporation is tied to whether we prevail or not on winning some of these. And we've got teams allocated on them that had better do well at it. And they do well at it in part through a process that we employ, a lean process for capturing new business. We have our own stairway to heaven for that. One of the things we found, and we've developed this over about 20 years, is there are universal principles about what to do. Understanding your customer and their requirements. What's your competitive environment? Fact-based specific. How do you compare against those competitors on the requirements that matter most to the customer? What can you do to change the ones where you compare favorably and make them even more favorable? Repair the ones where they're disfavorable and get into at least neutral? And take the ones where you're, you're in a bad day and at least get them to neutral. You may not be able to do it. We can look at that, assess that qualitatively, at least and quantitatively, to our best ability, and not only fashion a very good capture plan, but it also creates our entire communication plan, our messaging, and our approach for everybody in our organization. Up and down the line, we pair up people in our company, uh, right up through our CEO, down to the level of the working engineer with their counterparts at the customer and wherever else it may be over time for a calculated plan to communicate correctly and win. And that's connecting the dots. And we do it again and again. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example here. When we do this, we usually find a success rate. And success is defined as we get out of competitions that show we shouldn't try to win. We stay in, in and win ones which we wish to. And we're going to satisfy real win and worth. Of anywhere from 70 to 90%. We have a very predictable process, and it's because of lean and the wholesale integration from enterprise level down to the level of how we execute on specific opportunities as we go after them and why we go after them. We know it. High-level concepts to keep in mind. You need a robust business development process and methods to call upon that are relevant to the address markets. I have a counterpart on the, on the military side. He's got a slightly different stairway to heaven. Same principles, but different specifics that map to US DOD procurement practices, for example, that I don't care about on the commercial side. They're irrelevant to me. I've got to know the difference. He does, too. So they're, they, the action plans are not generic. They're specific to the opportunity. They work strategy down to tactical level. We've got disciplined execution and we satisfy multiple internal requirements. That's back to that operating system and how we do business, ethically, legally, practically, financially, and make sure it works well. We make sure that those capture teams have support. They have coaches available to help them, and they have leaders who require that team to implement those core business development principles, and they cadence them regularly. They don't kind of ship them off and say, come back when you've won. They want to know how it's going. They've got to have answers to those questions, and that team better be able to dynamically change their strategy because as we go after and our competitors go after new businesses, the customer learns more and comes up with new requirements. The situation changes. If we stayed with our baseline plan, which was as good as the moment it was written, we would probably lose more and, and probably most of the time. So it's a dynamic environment. We've got to go after that. But the core here is to keep answering these questions. Is it real? Which would you rather have? Uh, a win on, and I'll, I'll use an aircraft platform example just because I've been after it. A win on that 737NG 
They're, they're pumping them out 40 a month up in Seattle. And they'll keep doing that for the rest of the decade. Would you like to have the avionics flight deck position on that aircraft? Or in an aircraft in country A, which is just starting its avionics industry, trying to transfer technology, and has never, ever fielded a production success aircraft program, and probably won't for another 20 years. Which one do you want to pick? It's an extreme example. It's a no-brainer. Okay, that's the real question. Sorry? Country I. Country I, country C. You know, you can kind of think about it. It comes to mind pretty quickly. Um, the, uh, the win part, can you win? If you get to the point where your win shows you have no differentiators, it's going to be a low barn business. A lot of times we'll go in and look and say, hmm, let's go make it a bad day for the other guys. Because I don't think we want that. That's not the best thing for our shareholders. We probably won't do a good job for that customer long term either. So let's save it for when we're a better fit. Is it worth it? Are we going to come out of the back end of this with the kind of commitments we have to our shareholders? Those are the things that we focus on. If you do all of these things, and they're integrated at the enterprise level, then as an organization, you'll have a lot of success from a business perspective with those focuses. That's it. You didn't get to the last one, did you? Okay, that's good. Questions?